It makes me very sad to tell you that I cannot recommend Greedfall to you. I don't think it's worth your time at the moment. It makes me sad because I desperately wanted this game to be great. I think we all did. Like if you've been following any of the hype for this game, you would have seen very favorable comparisons to Elder Scrolls games, Dragon Age games, The Witcher 3. These are three franchises that are among the most beloved in gaming with a style of play that seems really underserviced at the moment. We aren't getting a new Elder Scrolls game for God knows how long and who knows how that's going to turn out. We aren't getting a new Dragon Age game for God knows how long and who knows how that's going to turn out. We aren't getting another Witcher game for God knows how long, but when it does come, I'm sure it'll be pretty great. CD Projekt Red are working on Cyberpunk and Obsidian are working on The Outer Worlds, but if you want a fantasy-style, story-driven RPG adventure, Greedfall is pretty much the only bar open at the moment and I'm not ready to go home yet. So it's for this reason that I'm sad that Greedfall just isn't that great. I love this style of game and I'd hope that Greedfall would spring from out of nowhere and fill this hole in our heart. Sadly, no, unfortunately it just doesn't. Now let me be clear about why I'm not recommending Greedfall to you. Greedfall is not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination. This is not a game that warrants any ire or rage. It's a very honest, very earnest product. And I want to really commend the dev team for creating this because clearly a lot of heart went into it. This generation, the developer Spiders has jumped from Bound by Flame to the Technomancer and now to Greedfall. And I really hope they stick with this franchise and develop a sequel because there's a few things Things here that they get really right, like the RPG progression, like the branching narrative paths of the quests, the different ways you can complete those quests based upon your build and your playstyle, the meaningful crafting system, and the stunning world design. All of those things are really excellent. The issues with this game, though, I think are best summed up by Bilbo. I feel thin, sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. I, I know this is going to sound bad, but I really believe this. I really feel like this is a 5 to 10 hour game stretched out over 35 hours. There are three cities that all look identical. Within those cities, huge portions of the buildings are straight up copy and pasted. There are over a dozen outdoor areas to explore as part of the open world, but they're all identical to each other, as though it's a single world zone in like Dragon Age, and it was chopped into 12 smaller and more sparsely populated parts. There are only about three or four enemy types, with anything else being like an armored variant or a straight up reskin, I fought the same three bosses nearly a dozen times. I came back to the same NPCs again and again as they continued to throw up new MacGuffin checkpoints to stymie my progress. On top of all of this, there are serious issues with world exploration, combat, stories, characters, the PC port, and bugs. Ooh, the bugs. Separate from the game being very light on content, what content is there is often deeply compromised. In any other game, the events and locations of Greedfall would have been condensed into a single playable chapter, accompanied by three or four other chapters full of new characters, new locations, new lore, new intrigue. Here, Greedfall's singular world is stretched out ad infinitum, and by the end of the 30-hour campaign, I was completely spent and couldn't wait to be done. As much as I had hoped Greedfall would be good, as much as I would have loved to be able to recommend it to you, I just can't, and I think you'd benefit far more from another playthrough of Dragon Age Origins or Skyrim than you would a playthrough of Greedfall. Okay, so this section is a bit weird, but bear with me, right? When I first reviewed Anthem, one of the things I tried to communicate was that Anthem was a flawed product right down to its bones. Like, it wasn't just the repetitive world or the bugs or whatever. It was something much more fundamental about a combat loop that wasn't fully functional or skill-based or a loot game that had, like, no interesting loot. I think a lot of people looked at Anthem and thought, hey, the core gameplay is good and it's all just the other stuff around it that sucks, like the story and the bugs. But I don't think so. I think the issue was that Bioware didn't understand what made looter shooters really tick and didn't design around those things as their focus. It was the bones that were broken, which meant that no amount of flashy dressing could have saved it. I raise this point because I think something very similar has happened here in Greedfall when it comes to what I would argue is the absolute linchpin of a game in this genre, and that's story and characters. I think a lot of people will look at Greedfall and see a 30-hour campaign and companions and loyalty quests and background lore, and they're going to think Greedfall has done the right things, and that because those things are there, 
that that's enough. That's what fans of this genre want, and the developers did those things, so surely everyone's going to be happy. But the way this story and these characters actually play out in this game is really not great. And in absence of that, a game like this cannot be successful. So let me break this down for you. Gridfall begins on the mainland. You play as Desade, a young lord or lady who's been appointed by his or her noble father to serve as a legate to the Isle of Tear for D. Legate is sort of like an old school way of saying ambassador and it's your role to go to the newly settled island and begin developing relations with the various colonial governors, each of whom have begun establishing cities as part of the settlement of this strange new world. Insofar as premises go, this is actually a pretty good one. We've got established empires all staking their claim on a mysterious new island and you've got this young upstart looking to make a name for yourself with a fancy title that gives you a hall pass to walk into anyone's court whenever you like. There's a lot of promise in a premise like this, and I found myself excited about what could lay in store for me. As I began conversing with various characters throughout the starting area, I was immediately struck by two things. You're going to be struck by the first one of them right now. We'll talk about the other one soon. Have you any more need of me, Master? You haven't forgotten that we're setting sail today, have you? Of course not. Your cousin is nowhere to be found. I've searched the palace from cellars to attics. Your uncle is beside himself. He was of a mind to paint the town last night. Don't worry, I shall track him down. Make care to your own preparations without wrinkling another frown. We'll meet you on the boat. Yeah, okay, lip sync. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is among the worst lip sync I've seen for a game of this type. Obviously, lots of games have really bad lip sync, but this is a story-based, dialogue-based, Bioware-style RPG. I think this is, it's up there as certainly, it's, it's not great, not great at all. I had no idea you would be leaving so quickly. What a shame. Almost no effort whatsoever has gone into making the spoken words match the lip sync. It looks like anime dub territory, only somehow way, way worse. I understand why this is hard and costly for the developers who are of limited resources, I get it, but I couldn't help but feel completely taken out of these scenes by this lip syncing. It looks comically bad. I had to train myself to never look at their mouths because if you do, you can't concentrate on what they're saying. Your brain is just going like, what the fuck is going on here? Because it's so confused by these lip movements. I think the impact of the lip sync and animations more generally is quite profound on a game like this. We all remember how savaged Andromeda was for getting this wrong. All right, what happened? To who? To whom? And your goddamn father. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. This genre lives and dies on the believability of the characters we're interacting with. Their emotional highs and lows ring really hollow when their face is so expressionless and their lips look like one of those clown games at the local fair. It's not an exaggeration to say that you are staring at people's faces for 20 of this game's 30 hour runtime. Here, the shortcuts taken really impair our ability to connect with the characters we're seeing on screen and the events transpiring. The second thing I noticed was just how good the voice acting is. I don't know Know for sure, but I'm almost certain the same voice acting company that did The Witcher 3 did Greedfall. For the time being, we've only been working a part of the mine because the veins run so deep in the tunnels. There are a lot of returning voices and it almost felt like homage to hear them. Either way, the voice acting is typically superb. Character dialogue is well delivered, often with surprising personality or flair, and tense emotional moments come through strongly. The Ordo Luminous captured several noughts, locked them in jails rented to them by the coin guard. They were tortured with the singular goal of forcing them to admit heresy. They obtained nothing. If I had not intervened, these men would be dead. I was very often impressed by this, and I struggle to recall any instances where I found voice acting weak or cringy, except for maybe this strange sort of like semi-Irish accent that the natives seem to have adopted. I didn't know that people from the continent could bear the mark of the Onol Manawi. What I would later come to notice and appreciate is how strong some of the writing is. Greedfall imagines a diverse world full of warring empires, feuding native tribes, faux Christianity, mysticism, magic, and ancient lore tracing its origins to the roots of the earth. Whenever we speak to someone, a part of their world, their culture, their beliefs, their backgrounds bubbles up through their speech. So you might be speaking to someone from Teleme about a missing girl, but they'll reference their religion which is dear to them, or the mother cardinal that leads them. When you speak with 
with the natives, you'll see the developers have clearly written a language for them that they use consistently, and they'll use turns of phrase that clearly showcase their connection to the earth. There's certainly been some world building done here, and the moment to moment dialogue reflects that in a very meaningful way. I do think there's a bit of trickery going on here though, because while the tenets of the world building are there and you do feel them, they reveal themselves to be only skin deep. Greedfall imagines a diverse world full of warring empires, but if you really spend time with these three empires, factions, whatever, you'll realize that they're all very similar and you'll struggle to tell them apart. Like one of them is more religious, one of them wears a turban, one of them is... I don't know, I, just vanilla, I guess. I actually can't remember what really sets these guys apart. When it comes to world building for the colonials, they have one or two totem poles that they refer back to, but there's not much more than that. In this regard, it's kind of helpful to think of Greedfall as a tale of two cities. One, the colonists who are sort of all the same, and the other, the local natives who admittedly do have a very rich and intriguing lore to sink into. I think my comments about skin deep writing apply equally to what I think is the game's biggest weakness, characters. The protagonist, Desade, is a very one-dimensional character. As the son of a lord, he's clearly wanted for nothing his entire life, and he walks the streets with this affected air. He insists on introducing himself to every single person he meets, expecting all who hear his name and title to acquiesce to his every demand. I have as of yet to present myself. I'm Sir Desade, legate of the Congregation of Merchants on Tiafredi. And as the title infers, I have the power to inspect this barracks and all that it contains. He really has moments of introspection or emotional vulnerability, and in 30 hours, I don't think he cracked a single joke or even made me smile. His voice actor's performance is fine. It's, it's great even. It's just that the character himself never says or does anything interesting or never shows a part of himself that might make us more interested in him as a person. I really think a good comparison point is something like Henry from Kingdom Come Deliverance. The blacksmith's boy thrust into the center of all things. This was a great character. He had emotional depth. He was unsure of himself. He showed true bravery. He knew how to make you laugh. He had a genuine character arc. Desade has no arc whatsoever and you will not see him change one iota as he goes through his various travels throughout Tier for d This problem is way worse when it comes to party members. Man, these party members suck. Like, I do not like any of these people. They are all so wooden and removed and just shitty. Like, if you've ever played a Bioware game, you'll have some favorite companions and like favorite companion moments, like Rex just being a badass all the time. It's the female shepherd. Now that they're fertile again. Oh. And shooting cans with Garrus and every single damn second spent with Morrigan. These blushing cheeks are terrified that you'll suck all the blood out of them once you're finished with them. If I feel the need to suck on anything of yours, Alistair, you'll be the first to know. These characters will remain forever etched in my memory because of their personalities, their stories, their quips, their sacrifices they made for me, and the quiet chats we had under the stars. Greedfall's cast never gets within a galaxy of this greatness, and you'll really struggle to reach out to them when you get so little back. As for the overall story, look, it's okay. Like I said, this would have been a single act in a different game. When you arrive in Tier 4D, you soon learn that a plague has spread from your home continent to there, and your quest becomes one of uniting the colonial forces and the natives in an effort to find a cure for the plague. Lots of things happen in between that, of course, like rigging an election to elect a new tribal chief, or exposing corruption with one of the governors, or uncovering spies hiding in plain sight. There's actually some pretty cool moments that go down, some big surprises, some betrayals to be had, but these are very few and far between. I think part of it has to do with the fact that there's actually no villain to motivate you. I mean, there is sort of, but sort of not. I can't really say without spoiling, but yeah. There's definitely no antagonist whatsoever for about 90% of this game's duration, and that makes the whole thing feel like it's meandering rather than driving hard towards the next major showdown. Overall though, I finished this game, it took me about 32 hours, and I don't look back on the story and think, yeah, it's awesome, I think it's okay. It's really just padded out, and had its biggest and best moments been condensed into a 10 to 15 hour package, that would have been pretty damn cool. With all the filler in between, I think it wears out its welcome. In one of the sections of this review, I'm gonna talk about why I think the RPG side of this game is actually really excellent, with a whole bunch of very meaningful choice, fantastic quest design, build diversity, and customization. It really does a great job on that front, but 
In a way, that commentary becomes pretty academic when the story, the characters, and the world building are so lacking. I think anyone that's suiting up for this sort of Bioware-inspired experience is looking for, first and foremost, a world that draws them in, a protagonist that they can fall in love with, a set of companions they can feel close to, a villain they can despise, incredible, unforgettable moments that make your head spin. Greedfall is either completely lacking in those things, or it just doesn't have enough of them, and in the absence of them, it's hard to stay motivated to play no matter how good the core game systems are. Give me an amazing story with average gameplay, and you've got me. Give me a really functional RPG with a shitty story, and, well, it gets more complicated. So one thing I wasn't expecting when I started playing Greedfall was just how amazing it looks. Greedfall uses Spider's proprietary engine known as Silk and man, like wow, it's just, it's such a pretty game. I know this is a small team working on this thing, but these guys are punching well above their weight when it comes to graphical fidelity. I think the lighting engine is what really makes things pop here. Every location looks so different based upon what time of the day you're there because either sunlight or torchlight has such a profound impact on the space. Cities in particular stand out because of how much they have to work with, with the midday brightness dipping into sun-drenched afternoons, fading to lamp-lit evenings, with even interiors looking vastly different as the time of day changes. Outside, some of the vistas you'll soak up are just stunning, but the skyboxes are kind of a cheap trick. Any dev can pull those off. What spiders have done here with vegetation detail and textures is really something, and were it not for the repetitiveness of these environments, you'd be pretty knocked over by them every time. Because yeah, the repetitiveness, we need to talk about that. I think this is best summarized with the following exercise. Here's me exploring the world at hour 3, here's me exploring the world at hour 10, here's me exploring the world at hour 20, here's me exploring the world at hour 30. Notice a pattern here. I think when you imagine a world like Greedfalls and you watch the trailers, you sort of imagine that what you've seen is just a slice and that the game is no doubt full of a wide variety of stunning and fantastical locations to explore. This really couldn't be further from the truth. Greedfall has two environments, city streets, which all look identical, and outdoor green space which all looks identical. There are over a dozen open world areas to explore, but it's actually impossible to tell any of them apart. As I look back over my footage, I have no idea where I was at any point in time because they all look the same. I discovered so many native villages on my journey and all of them look the same. So many clearings, all the same. So many caves, all the same. Like I said earlier, it's like they took the hinterlands from Dragon Age Inquisition and just divided it into 12 parts. That's it. The cities are particularly brazen with their reuse of buildings. Each city is apparently the settlement of like a specific people, each with their own history and customs, but all the architecture is the same. Some of it is literally exactly the same. The governor's mansion in each city is just copy pasted. It's the same building. Same goes with the tavern and the barracks, the same building in each city, identical. It's crazy that they did this. It's really immersion shattering and I think I just think it's kind of crappy. It makes the experience of reaching a new city completely meaningless when you see this sort of stuff. Separate from all of this, there's a far more fundamental issue with this game's world, and it's one relating to level design. Now, what you don't see when I show you this open world here is that it's not actually open world at all. These are specific corridors that have been designed, and I cannot go where there is no level. So if I see a gap in the trees, that doesn't actually mean I can go that way. It's just me running into an invisible wall. You don't feel like you're exploring an immersive world when you are constantly running into invisible walls. This is made even worse by the fact that you don't have a minimap. This is going to sound like a small deal, but it's actually quite game breaking for two reasons. Number one, you can't trust your eyes to see a gap in the trees and then go through it because it's probably an invisible wall. So your eyes are not as useful to you as you might think. Secondly, if you do take a path that seems to lead toward a specific objective, 
It could be a complete red herring. It could be a corridor to nowhere and you need to turn around and take the correct corridor to get to where you want to get to. What does this mean for you as a player? You can't trust your eyes and you can't just walk towards a location. So you are constantly opening and closing your map every two minutes or less. You are checking your map to see what the correct path is and to make sure it doesn't lead you astray. It's so annoying. And a simple mini map would have made this much easier. You know how the Witcher has that little GPS nav thing that appears and leads you by the nose to an objective? I understand now why that exists because Greedfall showed me how frustrating it is to not have this. In cities as well, this is a major problem because of how internal spaces are designed. Instead of being logically laid out structures like in real life, Greedfall's buildings are these confusing labyrinths of twists and turns. You literally need a map to navigate the tavern in this game. If that's not a sign of things being broken, then nothing is. Look, I know this is a very detailed and nitpicky section, but I think this was the area of the game that was most frustrating for me and also the biggest surprise. In the lead up trailers and all that stuff, it really painted an image of this untamed land to explore, affording me complete freedom to do so. Untold wonders awaited me. That really could not be further from the truth. The world here is small, it is subdivided, it is repetitive, and it is extremely frustrating to navigate. If exploration is your jam, explore other games. <laughs> Okay, so I know this has been brutal so far, but we're in the last section where I'm just gonna be shitting on the game. The next section's all positive, okay? So just bear with me, let's talk. Combat, okay. Combat in this game has some flashes of brilliance. There are times when it's working and I'm like, yeah, I see it, this is it, this is it, right, I get it. There's some kernels of greatness there, but they are very rare. The rest of the time, I'm just melting everything because of how imbalanced the combat trees are, and I'm just fighting against the jank. First of all, every combat encounter starts like this. Maybe in life you protect me in this battle. Come on, bit of if you steal my blade, then let's go! Notice the voice lines. Yeah, imagine those voice lines repeated three or four times during every combat encounter, and then imagine that for 30 hours straight. It definitely gets to you. More broadly, here's how combat works. There are a few different paths you can go down when playing, like one-handed weapons, two-handed ranged weapons, traps, magic, etc. I chose traps and ranged weapons, which it turns out are the worst choices you can make. Ranged weapons are just not a viable build option as they just don't do enough sustained damage and they have finite ammo. They're very useful in stunning enemies, don't get me wrong, but you can't play around being an exclusively ranged fighter. That's not a thing. Traps seem like a really awesome idea and they are when they work. But if you build into this, you are going to find that the traps have hilariously small hitboxes. So many times, my enemies were standing right on top of the damn trap and it just would not go off. You also can't kind of like kite enemies into them as easily as you might think. Add to this the fact that they're consumable and crafting them is quite annoying even when you fully leveled up your crafting and I just gave up on using these after the first few hours of experimentation. So in the end I would default to melee and it was very janky. You have one button to attack, another to kick your enemy which unbalances them, a fury attack which does guaranteed damage and another button to parry attacks. You can also dodge and roll away. The melee attack does that thing where sometimes you'll just swing your weapon without moving and sometimes it will slide your character character halfway across the universe so you can actually like connect with the attack animation. I think more casual players won't notice this, but if you're someone that demands a more robust third person combat model, this is going to grate you. The real issue though is melee animations and hit registration. It just feels janky with your awkward animations like snapping about and your enemies animations being so inconsistent. Some things will connect, others not. Sometimes an attack will land and it will just do nothing. It's very often a real crap the biggest animation issue actually relates to your parry though. You can cancel your melee animation whenever you like mid-swing with a parry, which means that when you're attacking an enemy and you see them start their animation, you can just parry it. And the parry window is really generous. So after a few hours of playing around with this, I realized that it was basically impossible for the enemy to hit me because all I had to do was spam the parry button whenever they were about to attack and I would be guaranteed to parry that attack. Combat started to feel like Arkham games, me just parrying flawlessly massive groups of enemies as they swarmed around me because the parry ability was so cheesable. What else? Um, you want to put some points into endurance while you level. Uh, wearing the light armor type means that when you reach endgame, you basically get one or two shot by enemies that hit you and that sucks. 
Uh, at around level 20, I unlocked this ability. This ability consumes my entire fury bar, but that racks up in just a few melee hits anyway. It does a huge amount of AoE damage and it poisons all targets in the area for more damage. It is ridiculously overpowered. And as soon as I unlocked it, combat stopped being any sort of challenge, except in the most extreme of circumstances. Combat in general just isn't interesting after the first few hours. A, because you're so easily able to just melt everything, but B, there are just so few enemy types. There's beasts which are basically all the same even though they have different skins. There's some bats, there's some human enemies but you don't encounter many of these. Toward the end of the game, there's these lizard things and that's it. You just kill beasts over and over and over again. Bosses are the same. There's like, there's like three bosses in the game and I've killed each of them at least three times, probably four. The final boss is different, but all the others are the exact same. It's like Halo 5's Warden. The first time you see him, you're like, cool, this is awesome. And each subsequent time becomes decidedly less cool. The game absolutely needed way more boss diversity than what's on offer, and it really robs some of the biggest story reveals of their climax, since after some big thing goes down, you end up fighting a boss that you've already killed three times. I said at the start of this section that there are flashes of brilliance on offer here, and to be honest, there are. When your melee attack lands perfectly, and Siora heals you just in time when you need it, and you parry an attack that doesn't feel cheesy, and you drop a trap and it actually detonates, and you circle around with your flashy bomb animation and it explodes, these moments feel great when they come together. But instead of being a well-oiled machine, combat feels like grindy gears, spluttering force sporadically, but often not moving at all, and making really annoying sounds while doing it. All right, I promised we'd bring some positivity in this section, so here it is. Guys, the RPG systems on offer here are fucking awesome. The foundations of all of this are the points you can put into core attributes like lockpicking or charisma or crafting, intuition, vitality, science. The biggest praise I can heap on this system is that these choices will profoundly impact your playthrough because the impact of each of these can be felt across the entire spectrum of the game from combat to questing to exploration. Almost any given quest you'll encounter while playing through Greedfall will give you more than one way to accomplish a goal. A quest to forge documents can be approached either stealthily or all guns blazing. You can lockpick the chest to collect the items you need or you can kill the guard to take the key. You can blast open a door if your science skill is high enough. If local tribesmen don't trust you, you can fix their weapons if your crafting skill is high enough. You can talk your way into or out of so many situations if you've put enough points into charisma or intuition. You can skip huge sections of exploration if you have vitality enough to be able to jump over a gap or climb up a ledge. In combat, these same attributes which aided you in questing and exploration also have a manifest impact. Put enough points into vigor and you'll be able to carry more ammo. Put enough points into science and you'll be able to craft potions. Putting points into crafting is especially powerful because it unlocks the really impressive crafting system whereby your gear has sockets and you can massively increase your stats by making alterations to your gear. You can even put attribute points into your gear so you can get an extra point in something like lockpicking by, you know, putting points into crafting. It's a very powerful attribute tree that can have huge impacts on your playstyle depending on how you mod your gear. At a much higher level though, the game is just extremely well structured as an RPG. You have companions with loyalty quests and completing them grants you bonus attribute points so you are heavily incentivized to complete these. The companions you bring with you impact the way conversations go down and may open or close specific paths to you. You have numerous quests which have branching paths and your decisions truly matter. There's a reputation system with each major faction and as the game crescendos your affinity with each of these groups will be tested. I'm just really impressed by all of this and it makes me sad that the characters and combat fall so short of the incredible bar that these RPG systems set. I guess for me, you can give me three or four ways to enter a room, like picking the lock or talking my way in or blowing a hole through the wall. But if what's inside that room just isn't interesting, then it doesn't feel worth it to me. Greedfall's RPG systems are extremely good, but I struggled to make it through one playthrough and I would have no intention whatsoever of getting the most out of these systems with subsequent playthroughs. Okay, let's start wrapping this up by knocking over some of the particulars. Greedfall is available on PC, Xbox, and PS4 for 49 US dollars, 
or roughly 20% off the price of a full price AAA game in whatever currency you're operating in. I played it on PC using both keyboard and mouse and controller. The PC port is not great. There is a very limited suite of PC config options, a big problem given that the game was locked at 60 FPS for me the entire playthrough. So yeah, that sucks. Having said that, I did get rock solid performance, no graphical glitches and no hard crashes. The PC port isn't a PC enthusiast's dream, but at least it's stable, so that's something. Bugs, man. There are a lot of bugs. Some of these are pretty game breaking, like certain quests not completing for me or quests simply not appearing when they should. One of these actually forced me to make a very important decision that I didn't want to make and that vastly altered my ending. Many cutscenes have awful camera angles and on more than one occasion, I was getting voice from characters who just weren't there. My loyalty quest for Siora was completely balked. I did it and she was just invisible the entire time. There was a lot of other stuff. I think I counted at least a dozen issues all up. This game is definitely still in need of some patching and given that these bugs had a material impact on some of my most important decisions and quests you may want to wait for a few patch cycles before picking this up but let me just take a step back and reiterate what i said at the start of this review which is that this is not a bad game. I know a lot of people will think that this review is just a merciless slaying of this game, but I hope that you'll recognize that I really did call out a lot of the good stuff here. The voice acting is superb. Some of the writing is so strong and leverages the world building that has been done. The story isn't the greatest I've ever sat through, but nor is it terrible, it, it's pretty good. The visuals are absolutely stunning. The combat can have moments of brilliance when it works, and the RPG systems on display are like an RPG fan's wet dream. They are truly excellent and an absolute standout feature for this game. For me though, it's just too little game spread too thinly. Too few companions, too few NPCs, too few locations, too few enemies, too few bosses, too few moments that stayed with me. If you cut out all the filler and repetitiveness and just looked at the best parts of Greedfall and stitched them together, you'd have a brilliant first act for a three or four act game. I'd buy that game on day one and I'd be excited to play it. I think that spiders have struck on something here, not only because there's a clear gap in the market for this kind of thing, but because they've got some seriously important stuff seriously right. I hope that Spiders sticks with this because I'd love to be able to recommend the sequel to you, but sadly, I cannot recommend this debut entry.